Well, good morning and welcome to St. Michael's Church, those of you here in the sanctuary and those of you online. You know, today is not only the one Sunday of the month where we worship in daily morning prayer, it's also our day to celebrate the day of Pentecost as marked by Father Al waving the dove coming in. So let us begin our service in spirit and in truth. The Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. You shall know that the Lord is in the midst of his people, and that he is Lord, and there is none else. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dearly beloved. The scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, seated or kneeling, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace, taking a moment to reflect on those we have hurt and on those who have hurt us. Confessing together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises. Declared to all people in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we sing.
O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Praise the Lord. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The Lord be with you. Remaining standing, let us pray. Almighty God, on this day, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you revealed the way of eternal life to every race and nation. Pour out this gift anew, that by the preaching of the gospel, your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. The lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. Please follow along with me in your pew Bibles on page 959. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. Please stand as we pray Psalm 104, verses 25 through 35 responsively by whole verse. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Creatures both small and great. There go the ships, and there is that Leviathan, whom you made to take its pleasure therein. These all wait upon you, that you may give them food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it, and when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide their face, they are troubled. When you take away their breath, they die, and are turned again to their dust. When you let your breath go forth, they shall be made, and you shall renew the face of the earth. The glorious majesty of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. If he even touches the hills, they shall smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. And so shall my words please him. My joy shall be in the Lord. As for sinners, they shall perish from the earth, and the ungodly shall come to an end. Praise the Lord, my soul. 
Praise the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please continue standing as we sing together. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Please follow along with me in your pew Bibles. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 8, found on page 901 of your pew Bible. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you so long and still you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Heavenly Father, on this day of Pentecost, help us to be so connected to you that we might become your disciples and the servants of others. Take our lips and speak through them, our minds and think through them, and take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Please be seated. This morning... I'd like to begin with just three words. Three words. Claim the authority. Claim the authority. Now that was kind of a test. Because if you were here last week, you would know that's how last week's sermon started. But unlike organists who can repeat hymns and songs each week, preachers are not allowed to repeat sermons. 
So today, let me build on those three words with three more words. Claim the authority by unwrapping the gift. What do I mean by that? Well, last Sunday, we celebrated something called the Ascension. That day, 40 days after Easter, where Jesus ascended to heaven after the resurrection. But before Jesus launched there, the disciples asked him, remember, are you the one Jesus to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, are you going to fix all of our earthly problems? The disciples asked, who? Jesus says, you. You claim authority, disciples. You are my hands, my eyes, my ears, my feet. Jesus then continued, though, last week by saying, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that's exactly what would happen. Ten days after the ascension, that launching of Jesus, on the Pente, 50th day after Easter, Pentecost, which is today, the Holy Spirit fills the disciples and equips each of them with gifting. And so that beautiful reading in Acts where the Holy Spirit descends on all of the disciples and it is a moment of moments. And it reminds me uh, where last year and this year when we flew the dove in at the nine o'clock service, we were all doing fine until at the end of the service, uh, the dove came off the fishing rod and hit Lane Middleton this morning in the head. Uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit has some business to do with us. Uh, last year, it hit someone, uh, uh, someone else, so that, t- take that as a personal message from God. Um, but the Holy Spirit has power. The Holy Spirit has power to burn away the chaff in our life, to bring us to repentance, to convict us of sin, to free us. But today, what I want to talk to you about within the power of Pentecost is what we find in the words that John read this morning from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12 is all about the gifting that the Holy Spirit gives to each of us and how the purpose of your life and mine is to unwrap that gift and live that gift. For as Anglican priest Mark Steeb writes, only when you and I live the gift given through the Holy Spirit can we then start to live as God really wants us to live. And so this is a message for all of us. Therefore, claim authority by unwrapping the gift of the Holy Spirit. So today, I want to be very practical in this sermon and give you a turbo tour of those gifts found in Corinthians 12, so that today you can not only identify what the Holy Spirit might be up to in your life and begin to live that gift afresh today. Claim authority, unwrap the gift. But before we start, some Holy Spirit given gift disclaimers, some disclaimers. First, we're talking here about gifts, not human achievements. The gifts of the Spirit are like a great birthday gift freely given in grace to be opened and used and attributed to the Holy Spirit. Second, each of these gifts come from one source, and that is the Holy Spirit. Meaning, thirdly, as I describe these gifts, don't confuse them with natural abilities. These are supernatural endowments, supernatural gifts, where the Holy Spirit might give you a hunger to claim that which you do not have yet. I think of Rick Warren, that California mega church pastor who hated speaking in front of large crowds. But the Holy Spirit gave him a supernatural gift to do it. And one final disclaimer. The fundamental purpose of the gift is not only to help you find your mission in life and your purpose, but the Holy Spirit gift is to help incorporate you into the body of the church. The gifts are not just for you to live out your purpose, but to develop the church. So the church can truly be what Paul talked about, the body of Christ together on earth. Not to be like the body of Christ, but to be the body of Christ on earth together. Claim authority, unwrap the gift. So, as I define these gifts, as I preach, I want you simultaneously to pray 
that the Holy Spirit wells up within you to give you an overwhelming hunger for the gifts he's designed for you. Some of you might be older and you've, you've been living these gifts, but maybe today there's something new even of the Holy Spirit for you. And the first gift is found in verse 8. Paul writes, wisdom through the Holy Spirit. You know, wisdom, the gift of wisdom. Maybe you know some wise people in your life. How do we define wisdom? Wisdom is the God-given gift of insight into how Jesus would deal with a particular situation. It is divine insight into human affairs. Meaning when you're stumped, when you're at a fork in the road, you're praying, Jesus, give me the wisdom. Give me the way you would deal with this particular situation. Give me divine sight on human affairs. But then Paul says the second gift in verse 8 is the gift of knowledge. Now you might say, what in the world is the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Knowledge defined is the actual application of the wisdom, applying action to wisdom. So think about it this way. You have a monk or a scholar with wisdom kind of cloistered away up in an upper room and they're writing books and they're, 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 they're enjoying that wisdom. But then think about a Sunday school teacher with knowledge applying that wisdom. So wisdom is divine insight into human affairs. Knowledge is knowing how to apply that wisdom. And we know people like that who just happen to have this gift of the Holy Spirit to apply God-given knowledge into life. Well, third, verse 9, the gift of faith. I love this gift of faith definition. One of them is the acronym forsaking all I trust him. F-A-I-T-H, the gift of forsaking everything else I trust him. But another interesting definition of faith comes from that 90-year-old priest, David Pitches. For many years, David was rector of St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Shirleywood, England. And he writes this beautiful definition. He says, the gift of faith is the supernatural surging of confidence in the belief of Jesus Christ as Lord. A supernatural surging of confidence in the belief of Jesus as Lord. Like a, like a riverbank surging and expanding over its banks is this definition of faith. And so faith here is not just an intellectual belief, which it is, not just a creed of the mind, which it is, but it's this surging from within, from the Holy Spirit, of confidence in the supernatural. It is this gift of faith, which in the words of that old Scott William Barclay, faith steals the will and nerves the sinews of passion into action. It is this gift of faith empowering a person to rush into a crisis, into a mission field, when others are running out of that field. It is a gift that inspires others and makes it easier, actually, for them to believe in God. They see your faith, and they say, I want that. So wisdom, divine insight into human affairs, knowledge, applying that wisdom into daily life, faith, the supernatural surging of confidence in the fact that Jesus is Lord. But later in verse 9, Paul then goes on to mention the gift of healing. Now, healing defined is, of course, the supernatural removal of diseases and infirmities. We're talking here about the physical healing of the body, but also we're talking about the healing of memories, the healing of, of bad experiences and, and, and the healing of our emotion, the healing of our anxieties, healing even our inability to forgive and healing our inability to be forgiven. You know, many people are sick today because they have not forgiven. Sick because they are estranged from family members. This gift reminds us that we often need spiritual healing to receive the physical healing. But the next gift, verse 10, miraculous power. Miraculous power is defined as the supernatural 
intervention of the Holy Spirit into the natural order. A temporary suspension of things natural to fit the supernatural. Now think about Jesus, of course, who modeled all kinds of miraculous power, right? He, he walked on water. He, he doubled food at a picnic. He turned water into wine, suspending the natural order of things. You know, miracles happen not because they're performed, but because they're believed. And for this reason, the miracle is tied into healing. Miraculous powers relate to healing. A person healed requires the suspension of natural order. And so what I'm asking you to do, my friends, on this Pentecost day is to live supernaturally and not naturally. Wisdom, divine insight into human affairs, knowledge, applying that wisdom to life, faith, that supernatural surge of confidence in Christ as Lord, healing the supernatural removal of diseases and spiritual infirmities, miraculous powers, the supernatural intervention of the natural order. But the next gift in verse 10 is prophecy. And I love this definition of prophecy. It is basically defined as the boldness to receive and communicate out the message of God. That's all it is. It is receiving and communicating the message of God. And there are two kinds of prophecy. There is forthtelling and there is foretelling. Forthtelling is preaching, it is teaching, it is calling people to repent, calling people to advocate for justice. It is telling your son he needs to make his bed in the morning. That is forth-telling prophecy, as Jeremiah did. Comforting the afflicted, afflicting the comfortable. That is forth-telling, right? Then there's foretelling. And that is foretelling the future as we read in the book of Revelation, the prophetic understanding of a future. But remember, foretelling the future, forth-telling the now from God. But later in verse 10, Paul gives us then the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment is the supernatural gift given to enable you and me to distinguish the motivation behind people and situations, to discern the motivation between people and circumstances. It is seeing behind the curtain, if you will, of a person's heart. What is of God here and what is not? Finally, my friends, Paul then mentions the gift of tongues. We could spend hours on the gift of tongues, but David Pitches has a beautiful definition of tongues. He writes, tongues is a spontaneous but inspired utterance by the Holy Spirit where your voice is used, but your conscious mind plays no part. Almost like a divine ventriloquist where you open your mouth, the Lord speaks through you, though, though, with one caveat, you're speaking a divine language you do not understand. So the gift of tongues is often used when, for instance, you might see something so beautiful. Maybe like this morning, the the sunrise on the steeple, turning our steeple pink, And you say to yourself, that is so gorgeous, and there are no English words to describe the beauty of what you see. So you look up, and you start speaking the language of God, and you realize his sovereignty is so powerful. When we pray in tongues, we are humbly relinquishing control and saying, Lord, you are so good. There are no English words for it. But tongues can also be used when you're faced with a big decision in your life or maybe even a a terrific tragedy, and you just don't know what to say. And you don't know how to pray. You've lost words. And you say, Lord, would you direct my language? And, And you begin to open your mouth, and God begins speaking through you. Edward England wrote some years ago that when I pray in tongues, I believe I am praying for specific needs known only to God. I know that many of you have the gift of tongues here, and you could recount many story after story about the power of that gift. I think of Bishop Lawrence. At every confirmation, you may not know this, but Bishop Lawrence prays in tongues 
over every confirmand. And I remember his first Sunday doing that, and I got a call the next day from a woman who said, what was he praying over my, was it Greek? Was it, was it uh, Hebrew or something? And it is this gift of tongues, praying specifically for needs known only to God, using a language that many of us don't understand except God himself, which leads, of course, to that final gift in verse 12, in, in, in chapter 12, the gift of interpreting those tongues. You see, God, through the Holy Spirit, has given some of you the gift of interpreting what is being said when someone prays in tongues. And that is a beautiful gift. The supernatural gift enabling believers to interpret those tongues through the Holy Spirit. My friends, as we on this Pentecost pray for a new Pentecost among us, what gift do you feel longing for? What do you feel the Lord's saying to you? And you may not have any, again, natural inclination toward that gift. Is it wisdom? Divine insight into human affairs. Knowledge, applying wisdom to life. Faith, that supernatural surge of confidence in Christ as Lord. Healing, the supernatural removal of diseases and infirmities. Miraculous powers, the supernatural intervention of the natural prophecy, speaking out the message of God, forth and foretelling. Discernment, supernaturally knowing motivations, and finally tongues and their interpretation. My friends, where do you want the Lord to go deeper with you today? You might have one of these gifts and you're saying, Lord, would you take it deeper, wider, and deeper that I may leave here today ready to be living it more deeply. Because my friends, when we don't, when we walk away from unwrapping and developing those gifts and only lead the natural life, the bad news is sobering. When we walk away from those gifts, we cannot therefore complain about the moral decay of our culture. When we don't unwrap the gift, power is removed from the church. And when the church becomes powerless, cultural and spiritual sickness spreads in communities like an evil virus corrupting the moral and spiritual core of a country. And one of the nations, one of the reasons our nation is decaying so quickly, it, decaying is that not enough Christians are claiming authority by unwrapping and living the gift they've been given. And we're living this natural achievement, and that's not what this is. Where is the Lord moving in your life? Where is He moving in your pew condo this morning and up in the balcony and online? What's He doing? Be proactive in your, in, your, in your prayer. Lord, I desire this. And when we do, when we unwrap it, look out. You get a healthy church where every one of us knows our swim lane, our gift lane, where we know our function for the good of the whole. And this is when the church begins to cook like gas, not like the body of Jesus, but as the body of Jesus to transform the world. And a bit later on this morning, you're going to hear stories of what God is doing in mission that, that just display men and women living through the gifts of the Spirit. Therefore, without even just one of you living that gift, we are weaker. We're a weaker church, therefore a weaker culture, a weaker community, a weaker nation. We need each other. Your gifts to enable in the church, provide the healthiest opportunity for the church. So today, claim authority, unwrap the gift of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, power, prophecy, discernment, and tongues. So let me finish with how this plays out in the church. And I want to take you back to David Pitches at St. Angl uh, Andrew's Anglican Church in Chorleywood. He recalls how a woman came up for prayer after a service, just like you can do right here in this bride's pew, this, this prayer pew this morning. This parishioner had bad arthritis all over her body, and she had it for years. And as she was being prayed over by the prayer ministers, one of the minister, prayer ministers receives a word of knowledge that comes in the form of a question to the woman. 
And the prayer minister asked the woman if she had trauma as a teenager, if she experienced um, trauma as a, young, as a young person. The woman, of course, wasn't expecting that question, so she's a bit startled, but she does nod yes. The prayer minister then asked, well, do you mind if we pray over those years for you? Again, the startled woman nods uh, yes, and as the ministers, prayer ministers begin to pray, the woman begins to weep uncontrollably, the tears falling onto her arthritic hands. But suddenly in that moment, her fingers are loosened up, and from that time in prayer, minister, prayer ministry, her arthritis would be healed from that moment. The forgiveness of her past brought the gift of healing to her presence. And as I read that story, I realized that in that one episode, five gifts of the Holy Spirit were empowered through the body of Christ. Number one, the lay ministers, the prayer ministers in wisdom, number one, discerned something had happened in her teen years. The prayer minister then acted courageously on that wisdom by asking permission through a prophetic word of knowledge, that's three, to pray over those years. And then through divine power, number four, the woman was healed. And not only healed so that she could be happy and live, you know, in that joyful state, but, but healed so that she could make an impact on the world for salvation. Five gifts transforming the heart, the church, and therefore the culture. My friends, claim authority today. Unwrap the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let us pray. Father, today, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of wisdom. Oh, Lord, give us the gift of knowledge. Give us the gift of faith. To some, the gift of, of healing, Lord. To others, the gift of miraculous power. The gift of prophecy. The gift of discernment. The gift of tongues. Lord, not that we would just be self-edified, but that we would take these gifts and use them to transform a desperate world. Remove any obstacle, Lord, that would hinder us in our gifting. Come, Holy Spirit. Rest upon these, your men, women, and children, that we would be forever changed, claiming your authority, unwrapping the gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Standing, let us now proclaim what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended, he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, kneeling or seated, let us pray together as our Savior has taught us.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us. And grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us. And lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. And let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people. And bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And take not your Holy Spirit from us. Heavenly Father, help us claim our Holy Spirit-given strength to be imparters of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, power, and prophecy to the world. Help us defeat our natural inclination to keep faith to ourselves. Forgive us when we fall into that trap. Lord, help us claim the authority you gave us to be Holy Spirit-filled agents of yours to a world in desperate need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We ask you to pray for God's people throughout the world, for Mark, our bishop, for Foley, Archbishop of the Anglican Church of North America, the Congregation of St. Michael's Church, and for all missionaries, both local and abroad, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, for all in public service, especially Joe, our president, Henry, our governor, and John, our mayor, and for all who serve in law enforcement and the armed forces, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our mission at St. Michael's Church of transforming every heart and home, the holy city, the hurting coast, and the hungering world through Jesus Christ. Remembering especially our mission partners, both here and abroad. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that the truth that has been entrusted to us and the lessons we have learned will not be hidden from the next generation. Grant us every grace that we need to make known to our children, even the children yet unborn, the path that leads to life. Make us a generation of parents, grandparents, and church members who will teach younger generations your ways and how to walk according to the truth so that they might set their hope and confidence in you and not forget your good works. May we be a generation who brings good news to each successive generation so that all may know your truth and the gospel of grace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We also lift up those who have come to us for prayers of healing, especially Mary Chapman, Viola Smalls, Ina Zadig, George Crawford, Morgan Falk, Vicki Proctor, Alec Dixon, Kelly Wyndham, Hayden Lee, Bo Asserson, Ginny Good, Sandy McPherson, Cecilia Gaddy, Jim Smith, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all the blessings of this life, especially for the baptism of Hudson Trad Harb today, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, remembering especially eminently McClendon Smith, for whom the altar flowers are given. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Christ, for your cross cross of forgiveness, forgiveness, we bless you. you. In your your resurrection.